I'm Sandra M. Gilbert, um, Professor Emerita at the University of California, Davis. And I'm Susan Gouvard, Indiana University. All right, and just look right here, please, and when you're ready. Well, Susan and I have figured out that I was the first one to encounter um, Betty Friedan's um, life-transforming book, The um, Feminine Mystique. I am eight years older than she, and in, in 1963, when the book first came out, uh, I already had two children, with a third on the way, and I had had to stay out of graduate school for a year for various reasons. So I actually was the uh, infamous stay-at-home mom of whom she writes. Uh, I was happy a lot of the time because I was planning to go to graduate school the next year, and I had really been brought up without any sort of feminine mystique. I had been brought up to think that I was as good as any boy, but uh, so it was quite a surprise when I discovered that people uh, thought differently about me than the way they thought about boys. When they thought about my career to be, they thought that I was going to be a wife and mother and maybe a part-time teacher or something. And I know that despite all the help I had, what uh, Friedan so brilliantly called the problem that has no name did get me down. Uh, I remember being in the pantry one day. I, I lived in a big old-fashioned Jackson Heights apartment, in, sorry, house in Kew Gardens, and uh, I wept in the pantry for no reasons that I could understand. While my children were tinkling little things in the kitchen or uh, gobbling up whatever was I hoped would be good for them to eat, I would retreat to the pantry and and weep, and I eventually wrote a story called Weeping about that, which uh, male colleagues said, oh, I understand that, Sandra. But I myself didn't understand. No one had theorized that for me, and uh, I didn't really understand that I had problems both uh, at home and at school uh, that men didn't have. I didn't understand them until I went back to Columbia full-time to get my uh, Ph.D. Well, in 1963, uh, when Norton brought out the feminine mystique, um, I was living at home, but I was going to City College. I was 19 years old, and the book seemed to have absolutely nothing to do with me whatsoever. And it also had, or seemed to have nothing to do whatsoever with my mother who was living at home with me uh, and commuting every day to a full-time job in the garment center. Uh, it really wasn't until Sandra and I started to work in the 70s on The Mad Woman in the Attic that I became interested in the history of women's writing and in the history of feminist writing about women's lives uh, that I picked up for Dan. And I think uh, I had a more intellectual, less visceral <laughs> response than Sandra. That is that for me, uh, the problem that w had no name, which she then named the feminine mystique, was something that made a great deal of sense to me in terms of the 19th century women we were studying. Uh, the heroines in particular were docile, uh, were constrained by what we called um, the ideologies of separate spheres, uh, were um, poor, dependent, and they were in the domestic sphere. They were in the houses. They were supposed to be angels in the house. And, understanding a little bit of the frustration, the anger, what she calls almost the, the feeling of uh, concentration camp victimhood uh, in The Feminine Mystique helped me understand some of the heroines in those novels. Yes, well, to go back to my visceral experience, I was doing everything but what we later on discovered women tried to do. I was, I was uh, not really doing anything to help myself. I, I stalked apart in joyless reverie like a Byronic heroine from other moms in the playground. I hadn't found what I needed to do yet. I wrote poetry, I, I wept, I, I suffered, and uh, until I went to graduate school and discovered the exhilaration of a low library running up and down the stairs and writing poems in the library in which the green man appeared to me in all his visionary splendor. Uh, until all that happened, I, 
I was really, I was really quite, quite hopeless. Uh, I felt entrapped like a Jane Eyre, and Jane Eyre was the first person that I was to write about when Susan and I began teaching a course here in this very building mm -hmm. at Indiana University. That's right. uh, That's right. uh, a course entitled The Mad Woman in the Attic. Out of which the book uh, emerged. Right. And when we were writing the book, we were reading other writers besides Friedan. And I was thinking about Friedan in the context of people like um, Mary Ellman or Simone de Beauvoir or Kate Millett. And I think what's really striking about the feminine mystique is it doesn't have that overlay of literary analysis. And it's rather more political and unmediated. And I think it really speaks directly to women and certainly of that generation. I yeah. think it spoke directly to a generation of housewives, of middle class, white, stay at home moms in a way that no other book ever had and perhaps hasn't since. Yeah, and I think that the republication of it now uh, is, is eminently worthy because the move for stay-at-home moms has, uh, has uh, grown vastly. I, I hear people say proudly now that they're stay-at-home moms or that someone has a good enough salary so that she can be a stay-at-home mom. and. Uh, and, and the consequence of that is a kind of, uh, you know, the phrase, helicopter parenting. Yeah. Well, there is also these extremely popular articles, you know, can women have it all? And this is very much a conversation now among young women who have careers and who have children and who are struggling to be good mothers and equally struggling to be ambitious and creative uh, workers. Um, so I think that actually the population is not anymore just middle class white women in suburbia as it might have been in the 50s. I think oh, it's really, oh. you know, African American women, working class women, yeah. women of every spectrum now are dealing with the, the problem that Friedan brought up. Yeah, and in fact, uh, the recent piece in The Atlantic by Anne Marie Slaughter, who teaches at Princeton, um, touched that same court, mm -hmm. saying, raising the issue of women, can women, can they not have everything? And why do we assume that men can have everything? Why, why not divide the everything among the women and the men? Mm -hmm, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? Um, why not let men take a little share of the nothing too? <laughs> That's a good note to end on. Good.